Hi folks, I'm Jason Kavnis. This is the Filmography Club Podcast. Okay, a little housekeeping. Uh, Later on in this episode, I mentioned that there are no deleted scenes for Magnolia available, which was a silly thing to say since there are, in fact, a couple of deleted or rather extended scenes on the Blu-ray and DVD. They're just not labeled deleted scenes in the menu and both give us a little more footage of Tom Cruise's Frank T.J. Mackey being as sleazy as possible. Item two, on a previous episode, I said that Will Fox would be here for the first three episodes, and you probably noticed that that isn't Will's name in the episode description. We had a bit of a scheduling issue, so Will couldn't be here. But please, don't worry, because my guest today is the supremely talented and insightful Dicey Wildman. Dicey is a Nashville native and a writer-director with a love of film. In addition to making short feminist horror films with Daisy Dukes Films, she fosters the art community in Nashville by co-founding the Defy Film Festival. That's an underground film fest that's been bringing challenging weirdo international cinema to East Nashville for the last four years. I went to this year's Defy Film Fest and had a great time. I saw a lot of great stuff, and I look forward to next year's event. I've known Dicey for several years, but we haven't really had a chance to sit down and talk movies in a long time, so it was a blast chopping it up with her about a great movie. And now, here's my conversation about Magnolia with the always delightful Dicey Wildman. One is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. Two can be as bad as one. It's the loneliest number since the number one. Hey, Dicey. Hey. Thanks for joining me. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, yeah. wait. My mic is doing something weird now. Your, your mic is doing something weird there. Is that a thing? That's that's good. That looks good to cool, me. Oh, great. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited. Yeah, I am too. I am too. Today we're talking Magnolia, Paul Thomas Anderson's third film, uh, his longest film. One of the longest films ever, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's up there. Uh, three hours, eight minutes, I believe. Now... There are currently a lot of movies coming out that are kind of pushing that, but I would say most of them don't earn it. And this one, I'm comfortable saying that it earns it. Do you really? Mm -hmm, Okay. mm Because I was going to say, this movie, I feel like uh, Paul Thomas Anderson swung for the fences. He was going for a grand slam, and he he hit a triple. Okay. It's it's a solid movie. It's a very, very good movie, but I, I think it just falls... Just a little short of great, but we'll 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 get into that. We're getting ahead of ourselves. I don't really here. understand sports metaphors, but I think I know what you're saying, and I think I disagree with you. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. I want to uh, I want to get into that then. So, like I said, it's his third movie. This one came out 20 years ago, 1999, uh, following uh, Hard Eight, which no one saw. Boogie Nights, which just he blew up the spot on that one. Everybody just bent right over for that movie, and. Uh, two years later, he comes along. He's still not even 30 years old, and he's given final cut. He's given total creative control for the first time in his career, probably the only time in his career. And uh, Magnolia is the result of it. I, I believe he said he was going to try to uh, rein in uh, his uh, his writing impulses and try not to just write a big sprawling epic and to do a small little uh, contained story. And the damn thing just got away from him. And uh, before you know it, we've got a three-hour, eight-minute epic, uh, which I think is a fantastic movie. But it, I don't. It, it's not his best. But I mean, his weakest movie, I think, is better than most other filmmakers' greatest. Yeah, I think that's fair. Or at least that's. I can't totally disagree with that. I really loved this movie when it came out. I was a teenager, and it was. I knew at that point that I wanted to go to film school, but I didn't really have a, much understanding about what good film was. And so I think this is one of the first movies I saw that I was like, oh, you can do it like that? Right. Oh, okay, wow. I read today where Paul Thomas Anderson said that he wrote it, not intentionally this way, but the Beatles song, uh, A Day in the Life. He said it kind of follows that structure where... It kind of just slowly builds, and it adds one little thing here and there. It builds and builds, and then it recedes, and then it does it again and builds up even further until there's this gigantic crescendo, which I guess uh, we're going to get right into spoilers. (laughs) Fucking frogs Frogs. start falling from the sky before the end of this thing, and it ties the whole thing together. Yeah, you know, that's interesting. I hadn't read that, but I read that, that and this is more predictable information that he really wrote it to the Amy Mann songs and so but I hadn't realized this other one and 
have you noticed in the rest of your research that he's often really influenced by music or is it kind of this is where that comes out? The only one that I've really uh, heard about is, is, is Magnolia. I believe he said that he based the movie. He started writing just because he had heard a couple of songs. In fact, one of Amy Mann's songs, a, lo- a lyric from it winds up as a, a line. Yeah, that's what from, Claudia says, yeah, right? That's exactly, I love yeah, that. Yeah, Melora Walters uh, actually says the line. Yeah, so uh, it was sort of like him trying to adapt mm-hmm. me- songs, lyrics, into a, a film or, or just something. Mm-hmm. Uh, he started, I believe, with uh, the idea, the first thing he pictured was Melora Walters' smiling face looking directly into the camera, breaking the fourth wall, which is, of course, the last shot in the movie. And that gets me every time. Yeah. I get misty watching that scene every damn time. I didn't know until listening to you and Will talk about it that that was the way that that happened. And I think that that's... It makes sense, though. It feels like it feels so beautiful and so important when it happens and actually so interesting that it's really similar to me to the new ending. Also, sorry for spoilers to Midsummer that ends with this like, oh, finally, she's smiling moment. Right, right. I haven't seen Midsummer yet. Sorry, it's I just okay. fucked it up for you. <laughs> no, you didn't. No, you didn't. It's fine. It's fine. It's not about where we're going with the movies. There That's fine. It's, it's the journey, right? Yeah, and he also said that he wrote, uh, he was just writing scenes, just images that popped into his head, and then he just tried to find a way to make them work in a narrative. He also had an image of Philip Baker Hall uh, coming to Melora Walters' door and them getting into a big argument, and then he just had to figure out how to make that happen in the movie, and the thing just kept, uh, he referred to it as the movie, the script kept blossoming into something more, which makes sense given the the movie's name. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I guess I didn't even think about that. Yeah. I did wonder why it's called Magnolia. So there we are. Yeah. It it feels like that, like almost a runaway train kind of, of experience. But it's also the way that it it reminds me a little bit of um, of Synecdoche, New York, where it, it feels like like also Philip Seymour Hoffman go like getting deeper and deeper and trying to tell like a truer, truer story. And the truer it try, he tries to make it, the bigger and bigger and bigger it gets until it's, you know, he's building a city and putting actors in it. Yeah, I guess that makes sense if he's going for realism because yeah. real life doesn't have stories that end. You exactly. Know? So you just keep writing, I suppose. Have you seen Shortcuts? Yes, Robert and Altman's? I thought about Shortcuts a lot with this one. Shot, a lot about Shortcuts and a lot about um, Nashville? happiness. Oh, happiness. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay, now it's been many, many years since I've seen either one of those movies. I do remember... I watched Shortcuts after Magnolia, having okay. heard that Magnolia was heavily influenced by it. And, of course, it was with the big earthquake thing instead of frogs. And I think it's the same city, and it's kind of the same basic idea. I guess we should give you a little idea of what the movie's about. We're certainly not going to go through a three-hour movie beat for beat. <laughs> but it's a big, sprawling San Fernando Valley film, uh, somewhat like Buggy Nights, except it's a bunch of different stories that are all occurring simultaneously. And these people are sort of loosely connected to one another and they are tied together towards the end in a way that's completely unpredictable and bizarre and it, the only way it, I think it could have worked I can't imagine tying things together in any other way except having frogs fall out of the sky <laughs> which is a real thing that happens apparently that's what I hear that's they're usually they tiny frogs okay. mixed in with like Philip Baker Hall said that this actually happened to him mm-hmm. in some other nation but it was a mix of like hail and rain and tiny little frogs. And I'm sure it's just got something to do with gusts of wind. Yeah. And I mean, it's not a biblical thing that I think gigantic bullfrogs falling from the sky, like like what happens in this one. Do you think that's part of why he puts the um, Patton Oswald story in there, where it's about somebody like getting picked up out of the water and then being redeposited somewhere that it doesn't belong? I think so. T- yeah. I think so. And he hints towards it the whole time with the whole Exodus 8-2. 8-2 everywhere. It's, it's everywhere in the mm-hmm. movie. Um, I, I've missed a few of them. In fact, I got online just earlier and started Googling and I saw a couple that I'd missed. The one at the beginning with the, the narrator mm-hmm. and the kid that commits suicide, but he fails at that yeah. and but he's very successful at getting himself murdered yeah. in the middle of his suicide. It's very complicated. You, you should watch the, <laughs> the opening sequence to this movie, if nothing else. If you don't have patience for a three-hour movie, just watch the prelude. It's bonkers. And I do think it's on YouTube. Yeah. yeah oh, just yeah, the beginning. yeah. Yeah, but there's that little 8-2. I think it's in rope. I think the rope is lying there. I totally missed that one. it just happens to spell 8-2. Yeah. Yeah, it's nuts. But, the one uh, that I definitely caught 
that I was very proud of myself until I realized that they were everywhere is at, in the TV studio. What the like guy who's standing in the audience, sort of um, like help, like reminding people when to clap. He's holding up a sign that says A two. Right. Yeah. The guy's holding up the mm-hmm. instead of a John three sixteen. It's yeah. an Exodus eight two. Uh, in Exodus eight two, uh, if you don't know. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. There it is. Those little weather interstitials that they throw in mm-hmm. in between the, the acts or whatever. Uh, one of them says 82% chance of precipitation. <sighs> it's it's seeded all through the movie. That's good. I love it. Yeah, I'm looking at the script right now for this thing, and it is a beast. Were those little structure points like the... the Web, weather and things. was that all in the original yeah, it's script? Yeah, it's in the script. Now, I mean, I just skimmed skimmed over the script a little bit earlier. I didn't read the whole thing, but uh, but yeah, yeah, they're definitely in there. And there's a slightly different ending. We'll get into that. Sorry, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so where were we? We were talking about. Uh, oh yeah, just the overview of the film, what it is. Heavily indebted to stuff like uh, Robert Altman's uh, shortcuts. And, and happiness, you said that it, it had to do, it, influenced by happiness, or no, there's no, no. some overlap I've, there? I was just reminded of happiness as we were watching it, because I've seen it when I was a teenager and in college, and then just rewatched it, obviously, last week for this, um, but Eric had never seen it before, and so... Which movie had Eric never seen? Eric, never seen by Mag- the way, is Dicey's oh, husband. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. My husband had never seen Magnolia before, but he's a big PTA oh, wow. fan, so it was fun, because it's just such a beast, you know? It like, is a beast. I have to be in the right mood for this sure. kind of thing, but sure. this was such a perfect reason to rewatch it. Um but we were both like, gosh, I didn't realize how much this is going to, this was like happiness, which is such a different vibe of a movie for, I mean, it Todd Salon's in every possible way as a, a vibe onto himself. But that kind of, that same thing uh, of with shortcuts as the ensemble cast, these people loosely connected to each other and kind of just this really prominent sense of malaise and, and unhappiness it's been mm-hmm. a long time since i've seen that but i do remember the distinct feeling of needing to like do something very wholesome mm-hmm. after watching and that never movie. eat tuna fish sandwiches again oh my god <laughs> you're bringing back all the stuff i totally <laughs> blocked out you did that on purpose that was your brain trying to protect you <laughs> but yeah shortcuts is so beautiful and and i love that that connection there yeah i do too i do too uh the the rain of frogs is a great substitution for for an earthquake i suppose and um yeah, a lot of the same cast. Yeah, Julianne Moore. Some, some overlap there. I love Julianne Moore in this movie. Love the her performances. In everything. All right, let's talk about the performances in this movie. Um, first of all, the cast is freaking huge. Let's go through the cast. I've got a list here. All right, we've got, um, I guess we should just start with Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise is in this movie, and the. Boy, is he ever in this movie. Man, he does some crying, doesn't he? You know, I. <laughs> think of him i'm like a big fan of of the mission impossible movies and the Mm -hmm. silly stuff and i think of him as being really great at you know some rock climbing and that kind of stuff and he's he's such a joke at this point and then holy crap he is so excellent in this and i've forgotten that whole stage of his career where he was doing eyes wide shut and he was really like amazing Mm -hmm. and now we don't get that version of him yeah i've heard this that his performance in this compared to his performance in Born on the Fourth of July, which mm. I've never seen. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. looks like another beast of a movie, yes, like a really heart wrenching so. type thing. Um, but it was th- this role was written specifically for Tom Cruise, and you could tell mm. he wrote it just to to show off what Tom Cruise is capable of. Because folks, Tom Cruise is capable of doing more stuff than just being the world's most powerful vampire, the world's best <laughs> fighter pilot, the world's best uh, secret agent, secret the agent. world's best pool hustler, yeah. the world's best. Uh, bartender no I mean, he's he's the world's best pickup artist oh, i guess oh man he's so scummy frank tj Mackey. in this big game that we play life it's not what you hope for it's not what you deserve it's what you take i'm frank tj Mackey, a master of the muffin and author of the seduce and destroy system now available to you on audio and video cassette seduce and destroy will teach you the techniques to have any hard body blonde just dripping to wet your dock it's hard to watch. It is. I was. I could. I caught myself like cringing, <sighs> just in a sustained state of cringe. Yeah. So we've got Tom Cruise here. We've got um, who do we have? Louis Guzman. I love, but he. Mm-hmm. I don't know. He's he's more of a supporting character mm-hmm. in this movie. Philip Baker Hall, the mighty Philip Baker Hall, is back for round three in movie number three. Paul Thomas <laughs> Anderson, part of his stable of actors. Uh, we've got Philip Seymour Hoffman, of course, the late great Philip Seymour Hoffman. Ricky Jay is in this movie. 
He's also the narrator. He's not just, oh. uh, yeah. Yeah. I love Ricky yeah. Jay. Uh, William H. Macy, of course, another part of the stable. So incredible. And uh, the whiz kid, Donnie Smith, great actor. Uh, Alfred Molina as Solomon Solomon. Solomon, Solomon. I noticed great. that. <laughs> great. Julianne Moore. We've got John C. Riley. Uh, man, uh, I love what he does in this. This is unlike any role I've ever seen him do, mm-hmm. really. It might be my favorite of his ever. Yeah, he took a romantic mm-hmm. lead type role. It's fantastic. Uh, we've got Jason Robards in his final uh, film feature uh, um, appearance. Uh, Melora Walters is back. and it, Oh, uh, the ever popular these days, Felicity Huffman. Yes. Has a pretty prominent little role in, in that one storyline, the little kid. And I'm leaving out a bunch of names here, but I mean, a lot of those folks are, uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just really going into the, the, uh, the, the stable, I suppose. Man, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Okay, who do we start with here? Hmm. You know, it's interesting, like, just saying Philip Seymour Hoffman and, and Tom Cruise, their characters, I feel like, are kind of the spectrum for this group of misfits that are together, where yeah. Philip Seymour Hoffman's character is so profoundly giving, and it's really impressed me to realize how young PTA was when he wrote this, to write such a... And, and I, you know, I assume... Philip Seymour Hoffman brought a lot of that to the character, a lot of that maturity, because he's just, I mean, 100% there and open and f- for service. And I mean, it's just, it's like so beautiful to witness. He's and a pure soul in so this movie. So pure, yeah. so incredible. And it feels like it gives him so much satisfaction and he's so authentically there. And then you have the exact opposite, which is this deeply selfish, inauthentic, you know, a fraud, a, a fraud. huckster, li- asshole, misogynist. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and every, I mean, everything comes out of his mouth is so hard to listen to. And then just everything that Phil Seymour Hoffman does is so beautiful. It's really, I feel like they're the they're the spectrum there. I love that they got to do scenes together. You know, they were in the Mission Impossible together. Yes, was Eric it two reminded or three? me of that. I totally forgot In that. the middle of one of those scenes, I was like, oh, yeah, Philip Seymour Hoffman was like a mustache-twirling villain. Yeah, they like they play yeah. re- reverse roles. <laughs> totally forgot that. Yeah, and then we've got uh, William H. Macy, who plays the very, like, uncomfortably pathetic uh, quiz kid Donnie Smith, a guy who was on a game show in his youth, What Do Kids Know?, hosted mm-hmm. by Jimmy Gator. And uh, he, he apparently was a big-time sensation and a small-time celebrity of sorts in his youth. And he's kind of grown up, and he's kind of pathetic. Mm-hmm. And, uh, man, those scenes are really tough to watch. It is really hard, yeah. Where he professes his love to the, the bartender with mm-hmm. braces. Oh, man, it's just so uncomfortable, but he's so pure. He's a good dude. That character feels so much more tragic than he already is, being like this child star whose parents spent all of his money, and now he's just in debt and, and out of prospects because there is another whiz kid, quiz kid mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, there. And so it feels like we're also seeing his future. And that's so hard because Stanley is such a wonderful character and it's so hard not to care about him. And then to feel that like, he's just, he's going to grow up and be Donnie is yeah. really hard. And it, it, even by the end of this movie, a lot of the characters get satisfying little endings, but not the current quiz kid. Stanley doesn't really get one of those. The last we see of Stanley is he wakes his dad up and just tells him to be nice to him, and his dad just basically tells him to fuck off. Yeah. And that's about it. That's all I get with Stanley. I feel that there is a victory in that, though. And this, this could just be me being pretty optimistic about it, but I feel like there's a victory there. I feel like that's such a breaking point for Stanley, who's so so much wiser than his years but still so young um and for him to get to that to have this traumatic experience on television in front of his friends to have his his father berate him in public i mean it's just it's a total emotional break as it would be for anyone um and then i think to for him to have that moment and confront his father i think i think i hope that that is like the beginning of him being a really different person in his own life. You just cheered me up a little bit. I hope I, so. <laughs> I've seen this movie a few times, and I, that never occurred to me. I always was kind of bummed out, but I think you're right. He, he you did do want, stand up for himself. And you want his dad to be like, you're right, buddy. Go back to bed. But like, right. he doesn't. He's, his dad sucks. Right. But he's, he's something new is growing in Stanley. Sure. And yeah. I think he's smart enough to do it himself. Although one thing I love about that scene when he runs out of the theater that I never noticed before is... It feels exactly. It feels a lot to me like the scene um, in The Shining, the Kubrick Shining, where he's mm. where Danny is running through the ice 
maze at the end. Right. It's like this following camera, and it's and it's interesting because it's because it's like the um, it's a studio, so all the walls are soundproof so they're just like white cotton batting and like it looks like the like snow walls right oh i never thought of that that could very much be on purpose too he loves an homage and so i'm gonna call him where i see him yeah and he uh paul thomas anderson did meet tom cruise on the set of eyes wide shut where he got to meet kubrick as a matter of fact he said he felt like an asshole when he met kubrick because he went to the set and he commented about how amazed he was like wow you've got such a small crew how do you do this and kubrick said how many people do you need and he said i just felt like just an asshole just a hollywood that. asshole for, <laughs> yeah i just spend way too much money so yeah we've got uh, melora walters oh man i'm stressed out even bringing up her her, her yeah. character man uh let me sum up her story cocaine crying screaming cocaine more crying more crying Cocaine, screaming, finally a smile. Well, in the middle there somewhere, she gets dressed up and goes on a date. You're right. But that doesn't right. stop the, I'm being cynical. the cocaine and crying, but there is a, she has a different outfit. There's so much crying in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> and I love her so much. She's really one of my favorite characters in um, Boogie Nights, mm-hmm. even though she's barely a character. I mean, with that cast, like, there's not even anything to say about her, but I just find her so... But she's fleshed out. Incredible. She doesn't get a lot of screen time in Boogie Nights, but she's very fleshed out. She has a big crush on Dirk, and it's unrequited, and it's never spelled out. Mm -hmm. It's it's communicated to the audience strictly through just facial expressions, and then the fact that she painted a room full of paintings of Dirk, (laughs) and it's never commented on... But then she winds up with Buck and finds happiness with him. But yeah, anyway, I like that ending for her. Boogie Nights had its own episode. But yeah, Melora Walters is fantastic in this movie. She's, uh, I kept rooting for her despite the, the coke addled lunacy. I mean, I just get stressed out even thinking about it. Her cocaine use, which is very stressful, is also so clearly her losing her mind. Like, it is so clearly not like a party animal cocaine thing. Like, it is, it's immediately clear that something else is going on there and so mm-hmm. it's so hard not to feel something for her the same way you do with donnie the same way you do for all of them where you're just like oh please someone like help these poor little souls yeah. out and then like thankfully john c Riley comes on yeah john c Riley. let's talk about him john c Riley. Th- this is the first time i've ever seen him play really the only time i've seen him play a, a character like this and again this part was written specifically for him to give him something to do that was outside of his wheelhouse that mm-hmm. PTA was pretty sure that he could do. Mm-hmm. So he got to play a romantic, uh, I guess, lead. I mean, as close to this movie has as, as a lead. Um, he does a great job. He plays a bumbling, somewhat inept police officer who uh, loses his gun, which is a big mark of shame, <laughs> I, I suppose, in the police community. And uh, he meets her because he gets called to her apartment because she's just playing her music so damn loud. Amy Mann's Momentum. And uh, Will brought this up in the Boogie Nights episode, and it applies to Magnolia, too. A lot of the music that's in this film is pretty much on the nose lyrically to what mm-hmm. you're seeing. And that song, Momentum, if you read the lyrics to it, it's it's. I relate to that damn song way more than I'm comfortable admitting. <laughs> and I totally see why a coke-addled lunatic would, would, have, would be cranking that song up, yeah. at, at least in this movie. It's also, I mean... You know, speaking of music being on the nose, like nothing is nowhere is that more clear than at the end of this movie when all the characters really do have their moment of of yeah synchronicity, um, which is such a huge swing. Like you were saying, I think sports metaphors, but it's you know I love any film, any art, any where you can feel the big choices being made, and I feel like that to have all these characters at their lowest moment, singing the same song. It's such a sad bastard song. It's so beautiful. Amy Mann's voice is in there, too, and her voice is so incredible. It really is such a big choice, and it could be really phony and weird from a lot of different different artists, but I just so respect a big choice. You got what you want You can hardly stand
it's uh, the weirdest thing. And when you read it on paper, it's like this, this cannot work. And I'm not a musicals fan. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying musicals are worthless. It's just not my wheelhouse. It's not something usually music like that just brings me right out of the movie. Uh, not this one, though. Mm -hmm. It's really sad. And it's, again, I hate to keep using the word pathetic, but a lot of these characters are just really pathetic characters. And, um, yeah, that's a wonderful scene, wonderful sequence. I read that he, uh, some of the actors maybe were not fully on board to do it. Sure. But then when Julianne Moore did it, then everyone else was like, well, she'll do it. Right. Shit, I want to do it. Yeah, it takes that first person. Yeah. You have to go, go be the first guy to ask the girl to dance at the dance, you know. It's so beautiful, though. I remember when I saw this in the theaters, I saw it with a an older friend, and she that she said that that was the moment that she was out of it. Like, that was... That was the, the eye-rolling, mm -hmm. fuck this movie moment. And I was like, nope, that's the moment that I realized I was seeing something really brilliant and really special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember distinctly, this is the first PTA movie I saw in theaters. Mm -hmm. And I saw it with Will Fox, as a matter of fact, nice. 20 years ago. And I remember distinctly when we walked out of the theater and someone asked me what I thought about the movie and I just didn't have an answer. I said, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Clearly that guy knows what he's doing and any disconnect between me and the movie it's probably on me and i'm gonna need to and starting with this movie pretty much every one of his films i have to see twice before i really appreciate it mm -hmm. uh, i remember walking out of the master again with will and mm -hmm. just I, I don't know if i like that movie or not and now i love it it's one of my favorite PTA maybe movies. i should rewatch the master because i don't think i loved it no i don't think so i, I love it it's great there's point but the points i love of that movie too not to skip ahead to other sure. episodes, are the like big swing moments where mm -hmm. you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. Now we're watching a very different kind of movie. And I think uh, PTA really handles those moments well. I do too. Uh, you break the rules and you fall flat on your face a lot mm -hmm. of times. Mm -hmm. It's just how these things are. But not not with this. The, the frog thing, you know, that's bonkers. And yes. when you explain it to people, it sounds like bullshit. But when you see the movie, it just works. And it ties everything together. It stops Jimmy's suicide. Mm -hmm. It, it stops the uh, the break in or the the, the theft yeah. from Quiz Donnie. Kid Donnie. Yeah. yeah, it's it's just wonderful how it ties all that stuff together. So I had totally forgotten about his his na attempted robbery, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but it reminded me so much, and it falls at such a similar kind of place as as um, Don Cheadle's robbery in um, Boogie Nights, mm -hmm. even though they end very differently. And sure. his is just this like wonderful stroke of luck. But it's such a like funny goofy way for all of that to go and then for john c Riley to like help him through that that was great <laughs> yes. that was great and then his gun just his pistol just falls from oh. the sky which in the original script it's totally explained where his pistol comes back from but oh, i think really? once he realized he had to cut that that uh, that storyline out it was like oh shit i gotta get his pistol back somehow why not now frogs just fell from the sky why not a pistol too you know what and that's <laughs> That's obviously what a lot of the movie is about. The the first, I don't know how long the, the preamble is, but mm -hmm. first 10-ish minutes of the movie are all about how coincidences are not unusual and that all these things that we think are too special and precious than it could only be in a movie, actually, that's just happening all of the time, constantly. And so these unexplainable things that make life seem magical really are all the time. They're happening all the time. And so I love that it doesn't need to be explained. It's just... Fuck, there it is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sure. That's life for you. <laughs> yeah, indeed. It's even sort of spelled out. Uh, the movie also sort of almost kind of gets meta for a moment with uh, Philip, uh, Seymour, Philip Seymour Hoffman when he's on the phone just desperately trying to get a hold of Frank T.J. Hamaki. Mm -hmm. And he says, I know this seems like something out of a movie, yes. but this is really happening. And this is that scene. This is that scene it. in that movie, and it's like, ah, oh, that's so fucking also, great. Also, I think he's talking to Paul F. Tompkins when, in that scene. I think that's who's on the other end of the phone. Is that right? I, I think so. That wouldn't I'm surprise me. Positive. That wouldn't surprise me. Uh, PTA was uh, big in the, uh, the the comedy circuit, mm -hmm. the alt comedy circuit mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the 90s in L.A., so that's where he found uh, Patton Oswalt. That's mm -hmm. where he got him in the movie, mm -hmm. which I always thought that was a little bit of a uh, little funny that uh, the narrator describes Patton's character as uh, an outdoorsy type guy. <laughs> it's like, you realize, this, you know, we've got a nice side shot of Patton as you're saying that, right? I mean, I love Patton Oswalt. I, I'm, I'm a big Patton Oswalt fan, but, you know. Yeah, when you're going camping, you might need a little, like, few extra layers. It's okay. That's all right. Scuba diving, though, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no. Not an outdoorsy guy. Oh, man. All right. So, Philip Baker Hall as uh, Jimmy Gator. Uh, 
television show host, uh, game show host. What do kids know? So I, f- I do feel, though, that his character is really where you s- we start to... Or it's where a lot of my attention goes when I think about the themes of the movie Mm because he kind of embodies so many of them. He embodies this reoccurring theme of of like inability to perform when you need to, the theme of of you know, shame around adultery, shame around your past. I mean, obviously so much of this is about your past or once past. Um, and then and then the idea that you might not even like be totally sure what your past was right right maybe he's blocked out Mm -hmm. certain things maybe he needed to have blocked those things out but so many of them talk about specifically the the shame of adultery and the shame of things that you did when you're a child Mm -hmm. shame in general is such a huge theme which is so so universal which is obviously what this film is about but then so heartbreaking Mm -hmm. yeah the the movie i suppose is about uh, what can you forgive Mm. Are there things out there that are unforgivable? And uh, I guess the moral is just treat your kids right. Yeah. Because yeah, we, we fuck our children up. We are, we are fucked up by our parents in, in ways that they can't control, <laughs> you know? And uh, that's, this movie really uh, digs deep in that stuff. It's Paul Thomas Anderson's recurring themes coming right back at mm-hmm. us. Um, fatherhood, fucked up childhood, uh, redemption, forgiveness, all that stuff mm-hmm. is just right here on top in this movie. Let's talk about that one or well, there's a there's a, a few really great long shots of characters. There are there yeah. there's some uh, there's some show offy stuff in this. Maybe not I'm quite as show. Oh, I love it. I'm here for it. I love it. <laughs> it's not quite as show offy as the uh, the opening shot in Boogie Nights, of course. But uh, the the shot with Stanley arriving mm-hmm. at the uh, television studio is just wonderful. Well, I I mean it's wonderful. It's so incredible. It's expertly done, and the way everyone you know, hits their mark. So great. But I also think it's really is, it's not, I don't think it is showing off. I think that's what this movie is about. It's about, you know, Stanley's walking this one path and people are coming and going and interacting with him and, and breaking off and a new person comes in. And that idea that interconnectivity is really aided in, or, or teaching us about the interconnectivity is aided by the use of these shots that, that everything's happening all at once and all at the same time and all together. And, I'm so lucky I have people like you on the show because when I watch the stuff stuff like that, I just think that's a neat shot. <laughs> it is a very neat shot. That looks neat. <laughs> I like how that looks, and I point at it and go, "Look." <laughs> yeah, no, you're I really, right. I think it's on purpose. I think, you know, obviously he got really good at it with that one boogie night shot, which is you know the good fellow shot, and mm-hmm. it's so incredible and special. And but it really, I think, is a, is a big choice in this one for the right reasons. Yeah, I think you're right about that. I never thought of it that way. And they're fun to watch. So much fun to watch. Yeah. It was great. And, and there's like a, even an elevator. They go into an elevator at yeah. one point. So did they actually go into an elevator or did they close the doors? The elevator stayed on the same floor and then they just changed the set dressing That's real what quick. I assume. Yeah. Yeah. I would assume that too. I don't know though. Because, I mean, you're really counting on that elevator going exactly where you need mm-hmm. it to in exactly the same amount of time that you could. And I suppose they could do that, but it was wonderful. Yeah. Oh, Felicity Huffman. She shined in that scene. You know, so I really love horror films, and it's one of my favorite parts about, you know, your classic horror is somewhere around the end of Act 2, you there's a character that has always sort of been, you're like, well, it's okay because they're going to save me. They're the doctor that knows what's up. They're the whomever. And then they can't. You think that they're going to, they're, they're on your side, and then, you know what, actually they're working with the witches, and you don't right. have a chance, Rosemary. Um, and I feel like... Felicity Huffman's character sort of is that for this, where she's so sweet to Stanley, and you trust her, and then she's not, she doesn't help him at all, and it would have been so easy for her to just take him outside for a second, and she can't do it. No, no, she dressed him down right there in front of everybody. Yeah, Yeah, and it's so, it's hard to watch, because right from the the get-go, she's really sweet to him, and it's fun to watch them interact, and you never, you could never see it going where it goes. No, no wonderful Ugh. so let's talk about dixon's rap 
Can we talk about that yes, for a please, minute? Please, please, please. Okay. And, all right. I've got it right here. It? I've got the lyrics here. I'm not going to read all of it because I'm not the dude to read these words. But um, I can't help but feeling like... Okay, a little backstory. This movie was even longer originally. There was another uh, storyline that was cut out almost entirely. John C. Riley at the beginning of the movie when he finds the body... In the closet, there's a whole Marcy, the lady. Mm-hmm. She mm-hmm. was a main character in the film originally. Yeah, that was the original plan. They I cut wish out. you haven't. She's so funny. She's great. Oh, she's so uh, funny. Oh, she's great. But they uh, they cut most of that stuff out for time. And uh, I can't help but feel like this rap has more to do with that storyline. I'm reading the lyrics to it, and I'm like, I don't get it. I mean, there's the obvious thing about the rain at the end, but... I will say, I didn't catch it the the... Upon rewatching it, I didn't like, you know, I follow the lyrics as much as I wanted to. And so after it was done, we pulled them up immediately and read them. And I was expecting it to just be like beat for beat every single thing that was in there. And mm-hmm. it doesn't feel like that. It it, I wanted it to. It doesn't. Present with a double ass mini kiss I bestow. With my riff and my frappuccino and me though. Think fast, kiss me oh, cause I throw what I know with the resonance. For your trouble ass, feeding in the wind yourself off of the back of the shelf. Jackass, crackers, body stackers, dick two niggas, master oh, pain, yo. Hold it, homeboy. I don't need to hear that word. Living to get older with a chip on your shoulder, except you think you got a grip, cause your hip got a holster. Ain't no confessor, so buster, you better just shut the fuck up. Try to listen oh, and learn. Oh, 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 cut it, Coolio. I've had enough with the mouth and the language. I'm almost done. Finish it up without the lip. Check that eagle, come off it, I'm the prophet, the professor, I'ma teach you about the worm, who eventually turned to catch wreck with the neck of a long time oppressor, and he's running from the devil, but the debt is always gaining, and if he's worth being hurt, he's worth bringing pain in, when the sunshine don't work, the good Lord be the rain in, and that shit will, will help you solve the case. Okay. We talked before we went live, I think, about this, so I guess we can cover that again. Okay. So the whole thing, there was a, a character named Worm in the movie that was cut out. He's referenced heavily in this thing, in the in the rap, um, played by Orlando Jones. If you don't recognize his name, he was just an actor that was getting a lot of work in the late 90s. Um, I can't really tell you what else he was in there. I, I can picture him. <laughs> I can picture him. But uh, basically, Marcy killed that guy in the closet because... That guy was abusing her children, mm-hmm. which ties right into the theme yep. of the of the movie. I hate that they cut it, but I mean, you know, we've got things to do with our day. Paul Thomas. I mean, Anderson. I don't have anything other to, <laughs> this to do. So it does feel there are a couple of points. There's such a fine point put on so many of these stories, and it does feel both like a really great choice and a little bit strange that there are pieces that feel like we don't get all of them. You know, like. John C. Riley uh, digging around in the bushes because he's going back to check on um, Claudia, and then you know some uh, gunshot gunshot goes off, and someone jumps out a window or something, and you keep expecting that to be a bigger part, and I guess it was supposed to be, mm-hmm. and so it feels a little like wait, so what was going on with that? And who took the the pistol? Was that Dixon? I really couldn't tell. It was I really it, dark. I think it's Dixon. It was really rainy. And I, I'm I'm pretty sure it was because again today I was skimming through the script and. The way he gets his pistol back is Dixon just chucks it out a window as he's just he happens to be riding by Mm -hmm. right where the guy is. And he just chucks it out the window to get rid of it. it. Yeah. Yeah, I do, too. But uh, again, cut for time. But also that feels kind of true, too, if you really are saying and this may be me being a little bit of an apologist for this, because I really just love rewatching this movie. I think it's so beautiful. Um, But that, you know. Yes, all these everybody's stories in connect are uh, interconnected, and everybody's in this together. And you're only gonna understand certain threads because there's so many sure. other threads you're never gonna understand. Sure. And this kind of accidentally becomes a little bit of a wink to also so many other lives and so many other things. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. It was like a almost like world building. Yeah, it's like you know, there's other stuff going on. This guy is a cop, so he's heavily mm-hmm. involved in all sorts of stuff that we're just not seeing. It's all happening off camera. Mm-hmm. I also love the way that he's a cop. He's such a like he just feels really decent all the time because he's having to he's in some really tricky situations, but I feel like he's always like pretty level headed, pr- trying really hard to be respectful. He obviously has to raise his voice sometimes, but usually somebody's screaming at him first. And right, Marcy know, at yes. the beginning is just <laughs> heaping abuse at him, I love and he's it. just sort of taking it. Yeah, you know? 
I mean, he lets her know, I'm the cop, mm -hmm. you know, sit down, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, he feels like a good dude. I'm I'm good with him ending up with Claudia. He even Claudia. says his prayers. Yeah. You know, he even gets down on his knees and says his prayers before he goes to work, you know. Yeah, very decent guy. I like seeing, I, I love John C. Riley. Uh, he should do more stuff like this. Yeah, you know, it's, when I, I, I forgot how full of heart that character is. I really, you know, I think a lot about his character in Boogie Nights, and, and that's also so full of heart, but it's so, such a more comedic turn in a, in a yeah. place that we're more used to him seeing that that buffoonery just turned up a little bit more and i mm -hmm. really feel like his brand of buffoonery in this one is so human i really appreciate it is there anything about this movie you didn't like hmm. you know i don't need uh tom cruise to take off his pants I don't need that. Sure. but yeah. it, it really is a good power move and it was a power move yeah. completely that um, was a great scene yeah oh i love that with yeah. that that interviewer i don't know what her name is but she handles that so well she was wonderful uh yeah when he got in her face and scared her i felt it mm -hmm. i felt for her oh it was so good that was a great scene damn it tom cruise man i right when i want to write you off nope. you you turn in a and i, I want to make fun of him and just say oh all he did was cry no no, no he was he was charismatic and he was an asshole mm -hmm. and just the stuff that came spilling out of his mouth you know, respect the cock, all yeah. that. Yeah, that's just, you know, that's real stuff that... that oh, uh, yeah, there's a dude, yeah. Yeah, Paul Thomas Anderson. No, that phrase, respect the cock, that whole thing, that came from just, they left, uh, he was doing PA work on some film or TV show, and he was listening to, like, they had just some audio that was left running, left recording, and some guys were in there talking, and that was one of the things oh, no. that these guys these guys were listening to some pickup artist, and that's kind of where he got the idea for mm -hmm. Frank T.J. Mackey, and that was one of the things they kept saying, respect the cock. Ugh, that makes and, and me you know the rest, yeah. so sad for all of us. I want to hate that character. I obviously hate sure. that character, but so charismatic, and I think that there's a little seed there that is some of the future PTA characters of, you know, some Daniel Day-Lewis turns of a charismatic, powerful asshole that sure. you can't look away from. Yeah, uh, the master, uh, mm -hmm. Philip Seymour Hoffman, mm -hmm. and that just oozes charisma, and he's just a fucking liar yeah. in that movie, but very charismatic, just the life of every party he's at. Yeah, yeah, that sort of is a PTA archetype, I suppose. But I don't really feel... I feel like it very much so now with Phantom Thread and, and things, but I don't... I, wouldn't have said that was a theme already at this point in his career. And so it's interesting to see those things start to kind of sure. poke their heads up. Yeah, I suppose this was probably the, the last film in the first phase of PTA's career. Yeah. Maybe Punch Drunk Love fits in there. I've never really understood how to think about Punch Drunk Love. Yeah. It's a little bit of a odd one for me. Yeah, he was he was going for exactly the opposite of Magnolia, mm -hmm. which which I think he, he did. He trimmed it. It's his shortest film. He went from his longest to his shortest he claims he was trying to legitimately, earnestly make a comedy. I do not believe him. <laughs> I do not believe him. You know, but this film, though, is legitimately funny. Mm -hmm. It really is. Like the part where Donnie is talking to uh, Alfred Molina and they're talking about how he wants to get braces and his teeth look fine. They're he has sure. perfect teeth. His teeth are much better than mine. And he's talking about how he wants braces and they don't understand why. And then like Alfred Molina's like henchman is like, didn't you get struck by lightning once? Braces are not a good idea for you. <laughs> like, yeah. So funny. The funniest moment, I, I, when I rewatched this about a week or two ago for this, uh, the, the the scene that made me laugh out loud the most was just the simple yes that uh, Quiz Kid Donnie Smith gives when he's in the bar and someone says, yeah, you are Quiz Kid Donnie Smith. Didn't you get struck by lightning a few years ago? He goes, yeah, yeah, I did. It's like, did it hurt? And his response was, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, love it. Yeah, yeah, it's a legitimately funny movie. And uh, speaking of on the nose music cues, that scene there mm -hmm. when he's uh, talking about his uh, rough childhood, um, "Logical Song" by Super Tramp comes on. Oh, I didn't even and catch it. All the lyrics to that are about being sent away and taught how to come up right. And oh, I love that. Yeah. Again, Paul Thomas Anderson made a movie that made me pay attention to music that I normally have absolutely no interest in, and yet. When those two Super Tramp songs find themselves on the radio when I'm around, I will straight up finish listening to them. I don't know. I mean, I don't I don't care about Super Tramp. <laughs> maybe you do. <laughs> I guess. Maybe. But every time I, I see it, it just reminds me of Magnolia. And it's yeah. like it's like a warm blanket. I just have to finish it out. 
So yeah, there's not a lot to not like about this movie. My only complaint about it would be maybe it's a little bit long. Even PTA agrees with me on this mm-hmm. in my defense. Mm-hmm. He did a Reddit AMA a few years ago and someone asked him what he would change about uh, or what he would do differently about Magnolia. And I think his quote was, chill the fuck out and cut 20 minutes. Ugh. But it's so hard, you know, like we're talking about Altman earlier. You know, I don't... I. I think I don't want every movie to be this long. I really don't. I don't want every kid out of college or to think that they should be making this movie. But there really is something if you're making this kind of slice of life thing, this very Altman esque thing, it's hard to to that kind of the like meandering style is I feel like really part of it. There's something really to be said for things you know, life goes on a little long sometimes and it's a little sure. boring sometimes. And sometimes you're with, hanging out with a character that you're not as intrigued by. And then sometimes you're just watching the most incredible thing you've ever seen in your entire life. And that's kind of what you sign up for. Yeah. 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 It, it's all worth it. I mean, sometimes, I mean, look, I say I've watched this movie more, more than five times. I'm sure. I mean, that's a lot of time to, con- to, uh, to throw at a movie that I claim to not love. <laughs> yeah. But I really, really like this movie. And it, it, I think it's because there's that thing at the very end that I'm trying to get to. It's like you have to go through all the cocaine, all the screaming, all the crying, all the drama. And then finally we get Melora Walters breaking the fourth wall. She looks into the camera and she finally gives us a genuine smile right when the electric guitars kick in mm-hmm. on that on that Amy Mann song. And then it cuts to black and the credits start, and it's just so, so fucking powerful to me every time. I mean, it catches me by surprise every time. Yeah, it's really special. I love it. And I don't know if if you if you sped up and got there faster, Mm -mm. if it would be as impactful. It wouldn't. You have to go through all that stuff just to get that split second. It really is just a split second. I think it's less than one second of screen time, but it makes it it makes it worth it. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. wonderful. So where does this fit into PTA's overall filmography for you on the hierarchy? It's pretty high. I yeah. was definitely pissed that Will got Boogie Nights because yeah. I really wanted that one. That's my favorite. <laughs> and that's in my probably top five, top ten for sure, just of movies on planet Earth. Um, but I really loved rewatching this and I really remembered how moved I was from it the first time. And I I would say it, it's second for me. Is that right? It really is. Yeah. I appreciate PTA a lot, um, but these are the two that I feel like I can really return back to and his where he is now I am I don't always fit into that as much to what he's doing these days yeah I don't have as much of a toehold in it sure sure I respect it I'm here for it yeah but I'm I'm I find myself I'm not hooked yeah you had problems with Phantom Thread if I'm not mistaken right well I mean, there's problems to be had for sure. Okay. Also, like one of the best endings on, you know, celluloid. So there yeah, you go. my jaw hit the floor. <laughs> oh shit! Yeah, maybe we'll have you back for that one. I would love to, honestly, because I really do. I mean, I have a lot to say about that one, and I know I almost did that one, and I'm glad I fought to to be Magnolia. But I w- it would have been okay because I really think that there's something very interesting going on there. There's also something that I don't find as interesting, which is kind of that like dynamic, problematic male energy that's actually not the most interesting thing on screen there. There's those two, the dynamic between the sister character and the girl character. And I don't remember anyone's name, but they were like so much more interesting. I so badly wanted a movie about the sister. Who she was, was great. Oh, so incredible. She, she kind of stole every scene she was in. Oh, my gosh. And so I was like, why am I watching she ran that, this that was asshole? Her house. Like, I want to see her and, like, her, her, the way that she wields that power mm-hmm. and knows when to kind of, you know, hang back. And I just, I thought that was so interesting. And then the way that that plays into the ending is, you know, so, like, that was so much more interesting to me than, like, all the... You know, stuffy dresses. Okay. Well, if you're up for it, I'd like to have you back. For oh, Phantom okay. Thread. Well, I'll, I'll do some we, we homework. Might, we might get another person in here. We'll Fantastic. See. Yeah. Um, what about you? Where does this fall for you in the PTA? Uh, somewhere towards the middle, I okay. guess. You know, um, what's your tops? I really, really like it. Boogie Nights. Yeah. Boogie Nights is probably my favorite movie ever. Maybe. It's so fucking good. There's a couple of movies that sort of compete with it, but uh, it's I go I watch it once a year. I mm-hmm. make it my business to watch that movie at least once a year. Um, it only gets better and better too, doesn't I know, it? I know. Ugh. It's just 
uh, that forward momentum that movie has, and it really doesn't let up. It's it's so fucking good. Um, yeah, I guess Magnolia is uh, somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm. Somewhere in the middle there. Yeah. What's your bottom bottom? Uh, maybe now some of them I've seen less. Mm-hmm. Like I've only seen Inherent Vice a couple of times. I'm looking forward to rewatching that again. Punch Drunk Love, maybe. Mm-hmm. You know that might be. I mean, it works. It works as a movie. And if it's a nice palate cleanser after this big, heavy, three-hour beast of a drama yep. that is Magnolia. Um, but, yeah, it might be. I, I, I'm not an Adam Sandler fan. Yeah, I really picked up on that with your Boogie uh, Nights episode. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a big fan. I mean, whatever. I don't wish the guy any ill will or anything. <laughs> but uh, you could tell this movie was written for him. PTA yeah. is really good at, at, at looking at an actor and going, okay, what can I squeeze out of this guy mm-hmm. with my writing? And uh, it was a perfect role for him. It's mm-hmm. easily the best movie he's ever been in. Yeah. I'm guessing. Um, I must because admit. I've not seen them all. <laughs> I haven't seen Jack and Jill. What? No, no, I didn't see the one where he dressed up like the overweight girl. I, no. I missed. Oh, this is, needs to I be your next. On... After you finish all of PTA, yeah. we know what's coming next. Well, I found Little Nikki to be a tour de force, though. <laughs> a tour de force of me never wanting to see Little Nikki again, <laughs> ever. <laughs> what I will say, though, about that I really do respect about Punch Drunk Love is, um, and and we've talked about it a little bit today, but I love that Paul Thomas Anderson is always really willing to acknowledge when he is making a reference and, and doing a purposeful homage to someone that he respects. And, like, obviously Punch Drunk Love is Charlie Chaplin. and um, But I think there's just, like, little hints of that throughout his work. And I love that he's not – because there's a lot of – you could say there's a lot of ego in a PTA type auteur sure but i love that it's tempered with this like i love movies and i love these people who have made them before me and i'm not pretending that i'm not going to be directly referencing raging bull at the end of my best movie ever sure. like that's what i'm doing and i'm doing it on purpose because now that's part of the lexicon of movies and so i'm i'm going to use that and and give credit where credit's due i really really have always appreciated that and you have anything uh, what are you working on right now so I um, am currently in a festival circuit right now with a short film that I made with my creative team. We go by Daisy Dukes Films because we make short shorts, horrors for women. Um, and we uh, made a film called Coming Alive, which we're um, doing little festivals with. And then working on the next one called Hope Chest. So we'll hopefully shoot that this winter. Um, all of that you can find on daisydukesfilms.com. Thank you so much for coming, Dicey. Thank you for having me. This is so fun. Absolutely. Uh, it's a pleasure. I look forward to having you back for Phantom Thread, I think. I'm in. I'm in. Totally. Fantastic. I'll wear my best velveteen stuffy dresses. All right. Well, that's it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. All right. That does it for episode three. I think we're going to try to get Dicey to come back later this season. I really enjoyed having her on. As always, I want to thank Michael Leeds, Will Fox, Harrison Holmes, and Ross Warner. That's Ross's music you're hearing right now, is uh, Uncle Skeleton Project. I encourage you to look up Uncle Skeleton's music. It's really good stuff. Filmography Club is brought to you by the hardworking folks that we own this town, and it's recorded right here in Nashville, Tennessee. Join me in a couple of weeks when we talk about a 90-minute Adam Sandler movie. God help us. Punch Drunk Love, y'all. Thanks for listening.